Our Father, we just sung with our lips the desire of our heart that you would be praised in our midst this day. We would ask that you'd give Nick help in his teaching, give all of us ears to hear. We pray that you would enable us to be discerning Christians in a day of doctrinal and practical departure from your truth. Help us to be armed against those deviations so that we might all the more love and practice the truth mm. in this day of declension. Make us to be stalwart soldiers of Christ. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You ready for him? It's going? Right. Okay. So uh, last week we uh, started on our study of the social justice movement within the evangelical church. Uh, we went through an overview of the history of some of the philosophical basis for Marxism and what eventually turned into cultural Marxism and then what eventually turned into a social justice movement within the evangelical church. I will give maybe a brief five minute s uh, summary of what we talked about. Uh, it was recorded, if you guys want to listen to it, it's online, we can sh point you there afterwards. But basically, uh, you know, we're dealing with social justice. And it was uh, originally coined by a Roman Catholic Jesuit priest back in Latin America in the 1800s to just describe applying justice to society. We then realized uh, the modern definition is not that. Uh, it is more of a state redistribution of privileges, advantages, and resources to underprivileged peoples. Uh, and so we kind of looked into, you know, where do those terms come from? Where does this ideology mindset come from? So we went back to Europe in the 1800s, 1700s, and we uh, looked at a man named George Hegel and his philosophy called the Hegelian dialectic, which is basically summed up that there is no such thing as um, absolute truth. Uh, truth is fluid, it's constantly evolving just like humanity is evolving. So you have thesis, which is one truth, accepted truth in history, and then you have an opposite truth or an opposite viewpoint come up, and these two clash and they merge together into a synthesis, which is kind of a third way. It's a mixture of both the, the truth accepted at that time and the opposite. And this keeps going on throughout history. You never arrive at an ultimate truth. It's always morphing and it's always in dialogue with uh, its uh, counterfeits or its uh, antithesis. So we looked at that briefly and then we saw how that built up Marxism. Uh, Classical Marxism, we talked about that, where Mar Marx, uh, Karl Marx uh, looked at the world as divided between oppressors and oppressed, and he saw it all as an economic thing, so those who controlled the means of production oppressed those workers, and he called them the bourgeoisie, or the oppressors, and the proletariat were the uh, oppressed. And we saw how revolutions to equalize everything in society and bring about Marxist communism happened in Russia and Eastern Europe, but didn't happen in the rest of the world. So we saw why didn't that happen. Basically, Marx's disciples down through the years uh, began to develop what we call neo-Marxism, which said, listen, the idea is not it's purely economic. The world and the reason why it didn't go through revolution is that there are cultural institutions in the West that are preventing this revolution. And these cultural institutions are the family, the church, the courts, the schools, and the uh, and, and other and media. And so basically we saw how different <laughs> schools like the Frankfurt School and, and uh, uh, Gramsci, what was this for? Uh, Antonio, Antonio Gramsci, Gramsci, that's right. Gramsci, yes. That's right. Uh, developed the idea that what happens is you need to infiltrate society's institutions and structures before you can have a revolution where everything gets equalized. So we looked at that, we saw how we had the critical theory developed and political correctness and intersectionality, all developed by these different uh, think tanks and schools and how that got applied to American society in the 60s and even before that and then how it seeped into the church. And so now we're dealing with that. You know, now that this is in the church, what do we do about it as people are kind of mixing the idea of Marxism with Christianity? How do, we, uh, how do we deal with that? So that was a very hurried survey. And, uh, we went over a lot of stuff. So again, that recording is online if you guys want to listen to it. Uh, but I will read really quickly uh, kind of a, a final bit on that. Uh, this is from a paper I wrote for CBTS uh, kind of summarizing the situation in the church here. So talking about neo-Marxism or cultural Marxism, the church in the West has not been spared from all this as we saw that the neo-Marxists set their sights on cultural institutions such as the church and they wanted to influence it to bring about cultural revolution. All the ideologies mentioned above have come into the church. 
Christians who are black or Latino or non-white have imbibed this view that they are part of an oppressed subgroup in society and that within the church they are oppressed. They claim that white Christians need to make penance for the crimes of white Christians in the past and invest money into the black churches to make up for it. Women in the church now believe they are oppressed and that male leadership in the churches is just another form of cultural hegemony and that this structure needs to be torn down and to allow women to lead and preach. Men and women in the church who have struggled with homosexual impulses are now identifying as gay Christians and are claiming they are oppressed and they, uh, and they don't want to seek the help to overcome their wounds from the past because they believe they are born that way. They demand that they are allowed to share family life with moms and dads and their kids because they will never have this because, like I said, they were born this way. So we talked about that at the end, too, is how these three kind of fronts are in the church when it comes to the egalitarian movement with the, you know, women wanting to preach and lead in churches, the uh, kind of racial issues, and then the sexuality issues. And so we kind of briefly touched on this last bit uh, last week, and I wanted to dive more deeply into this today, is uh, biblical justice versus social justice. The actual definition of what the Bible gives when it comes to judgment or justice and when it talks about rights. And so I'm going to be pulling extensively today from social justice versus biblical justice, how good intentions undermine justice and the gospel. It's about like a 40-page booklet. I would encourage everyone in this room to buy this. It's about five bucks and it's extremely well written. There's a lot of information in it. It's written by a man named Dr. E. Calvin Beisner. He has uh, spoken on topics such as climate change and justice and it's it's very good. So, uh, you know, I'm going to be pulling a lot today from this. Oh, Nick? Yes. Maybe you should mention what's in the back of the book, too. Oh, well, I was just, you, yeah, I was just about to go there. <laughs> We're just the same wavelength. And we will obviously end today with our, some excerpts from the Dallas Statement on Social Justice, which was a uh, evangelical statement, mostly reformed statement, really, that was put together by some good reform men back in 2018, responding to this movement. Um, so, you okay with that, Denny? Is that, okay, hopefully. Okay, uh, so if you guys can remember last week, we had begun to talk about the terms in the Bible that deal with justice. So in the Old Testament, we have shafat, mishfat, din, and tzedek. Those are the words in Hebrew that de delineate uh, justice or righteous government processes. And then we have the New Testament Koine Greek uh, equivalents such as uh, decay and krino. And so those are some of the words in the original languages that are used for this idea of justice or judgment. And when it comes down to it, if you want to summarize, this is Beisner here, summarize the biblical concept of justice, it is basically this. It is rendering impartially and proportionately to everyone their due in accordance with the righteous standard of God's moral law. So there's really some major aspects here that we're gonna look at. We're gonna look at not being partial. So one of the major first aspects of biblical justice is impartiality. It's having the same set of rules for everyone in society. No one is shown partiality in, in, in any process. It's simply the same set of rules for everyone in society. That's being impartial, not showing favoritism. We see that in James in the New Testament. It says, don't play favorites, even with the poor. No one's to be given partiality. A second major thing is proportionality, to giving each person what they're due. So that looks at basically, if you have done something wrong, uh, you are to be punished in proportion to the offense that you've violated, or the, the, the law that you violated. Uh, that's, you know, in the Sermon on the Mount, in the Old Testament, you see the, uh, the concept of an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Basically meaning if someone knocks your tooth out in a fight, the proportionality concept and principle is that you don't get to kill them for doing that. The most you get to basically retort back is a tooth or an eye for an eye in the same concept. So this idea of proportionality is that if you do something, you're only going to be punished in with proportion of how you violated the law. So there isn't this wide spectrum of vindicative justice that's put upon people for doing something wrong. It goes for rewards too. Jesus, when he comes back in his glory with his, the Father and his holy angels, are going, he's going to give to each man according to his due, meaning he's going to proportionally give to those uh, you know, what you have done. So this idea of proportionality is all throughout the Old and New Testament, as well as impartiality. 
And then obviously the, the ultimate standard to all these things that they connect to is the Ten Commandments. We've been going through that in the last few months at, uh, at Providence here and basically looking at the law of God, the Ten Commandments. So in the Bible, these are the basic principles that are discussed. There, there really isn't anything else that's talked about. These are the main points that the Bible goes to when you're looking at the Greek or the Hebrew that it's talking about impartiality proportionality, and God's law being the ones that kind of sets the standard. So I'm going to read a few uh, examples here uh, of how this plays out. So the first principle, impor- uh, impartiality. When Moses commissioned the judges of Israel, he charged them, Here are the cases, judge or shafat between your brethren, and shafat righteously between a man and his brother or the stranger who is with him. You shall not show partiality in judgment. You shall hear the small as well as the great. You shall not be afraid in any man's presence, for the judgment, mishfat, is God's. And that was from Deuteronomy 11, 16-17. So you see that in the, the, the case laws in the Old Testament, as God's giving the judicial or civil law to the people of Israel, this idea of impartiality is, is given to Moses and all the judges that he appoints to look over all the cases that come to him. And so uh, that would be the major Old Testament example. And then we go to uh, Leviticus for an example of proportionality. So first, proportionality distinguishes general violations of property versus violations of persons. There are different kinds and degrees of punishment described for the two, Leviticus 24, 17 through 21. Second, proportionality distinguishes accidental harm, negligent harm, and intentional harm. So as you see in Exodus and Leviticus, if someone is killed uh, accidentally, the person that is basically guilty of manslaughter is given a city of refuge to flee to, uh, and he's not to be punished because he did it without knowing. It was an accident. And then there's degrees from that. If you kill someone negligent, meaning like if you weren't running something correctly in the farm or the business that you're operating and something within your business kills someone, it wasn't totally accidental, but it wasn't purposeful, so it's negligent. So there's a, there's a, there's a potential for the death penalty, but at the same time, basically a fee or a fine is given to the family of the lost or the person that died, and then there's intentional homicide. That person dies, no matter what, if you kill someone intentionally, you die, that's a death penalty. So you see there's varying degrees of judgment that are basically applied uh, to these situations. So that's the major example of proportionality, I would say. And then finally, the Ten Commandments that we've been dealing with. God's law is the standard by which you see if you, how, how do we know if you violated something? Well, does it violate one of the Ten Commandments? Uh, ultimately, it always boils down to the Ten Commandments, the Decalogue, God's law. That's the standard of justice. That's God's law. If you violate it, you will be punished in proportion to how you violated that. So with this idea, now quickly, before I move on, any questions at this point? I know I've said kind of a lot really quickly, but any comments, questions, concerns, disagreements with what I've said so far? Yes, Denny. Uh, I'm just wondering, are you, you going to be comparing this to the opposite, for example, of improportion? Impropor- can't say the word. In- Disproportionate? There we go, this part. That's the proportionality. Yeah, are you going uh, yeah. to comparison to that? Or? Uh, somewhat. I mean, I'm going to be going into how, how this kind of gets delineated and the negative versus positive rights. We're about to jump into that, but yeah, kind of, kind of something similar like that. Mitch, so. you have a question? I'll just ask you later. It's kind of a side. Escalator? No, no. Escalator. I can, I can, no, I said I can ask you later. Oh, I was like, oh. <laughs> this is going to escalate. <laughs> oh, boy. I'm nervous for a second. I mean, I don't have this, like, I'm not master of this subject. I, uh, so, I, anyways. Um, so, anyway, so basically when we talk about the law of God and the standards for justice, what eventually is implied is, well, then people must have rights then. They're, they're, people have rights if, there are, can, if they can be violated, if there's punishment for doing certain things, if people are given um, impartial judgment when it comes to everything that's happening in their life. People must have rights. But the debate is not between whether people don't have rights or whether they do. It's de- the debate is between whether they have negative or positive rights. 
And so uh, let me read this quickly from, from Beisner. An important question is whether God's law, the standard of justice, and the basis of rights entails both negative rights, rights against harm, and positive rights, rights to certain benefits. Uh, and as we will see, uh, the progressive social justice movement uh, heavily relies on the idea that we have positive rights, while the more biblical conservative camp says, no, it's, it's purely negative. The, our rights are negative in nature. So an example of this is what we're talking about today, the, the, the Sabbath, the, the fourth commandment. Basically, the, what we have is we have a right to rest one out of seven days. That is a negative right. We have a right to not work every single day of our lives. We have a right to have a one day of rest. And obviously, we believe that is the Lord's Day Sunday. But that's the idea of a negative right. You're not forced to work on a day that you should have rest. Another one is we have a right to not have things stolen from us. So if you have food, you, don't, you have the right to have the protection of your property. Positive rights would say something like this. You have the right to not starve, and you have the right to food. Not to have it not stolen, but you have the right to have your, your needs met. So in essence, if someone says, well, I have the positive right to not starve, I have the positive right to have the, my daily needs and food met, that easily turns into, if I see someone that has something I don't have, the positive right out, outweighs the negative right. It cancels it out because it says, I can take that fruit from that other person that has a lot to supply my positive right. So the negative right of that person of being, I have the right to not have my stuff stolen is canceled because the positive right of the person hungry and wanting his food says, well, I have a positive right to food. So it cancels the negative right out. And we'll see more examples of this, but the idea of positive rights, I think, has slipped into many of our thinking as well. As I've read over this, I realized that I probably had a little bit more of a mixed view of rights. I didn't really see it purely as negative. Uh, but uh, it, it, just two of those examples, you know, you shall not steal and the, remember the Sabbath day. Those are negative rights to not have stuff stolen from you and the right to not have to work every single day of your life, but to have one in seven as a rest. It sounds like what you're saying is that a lot of what's being advocated is a violation of the Ten Commandments. Right. Thou shalt not steal and right. thou shalt not covet. Thou shalt not covet, absolutely, there's right. another one. Through socialism, you know, redistribution, oh. all that. Seems exactly, seems right. and, and the idea of, you know, to, to not give false witness. So you have the right to not have your name defamed, but you don't have the right to not have your name defamed if you're a liar or a drunkard. That the, the, right, the right to not have your name defamed isn't a positive right that you always must have a good name. It's different. You have to delineate between if you have the right to not be defamed, that means you can't have someone speak ill of you for the false and a false pretense. But if you did something wrong, you can be called that because you did do that. You were in violation and therefore you're, you're a, a thief if you've stolen something. Um, so, think, yes, please. It has to be the other ones added that it has to be defined by a certain standard. That's right. It can't be just whatever because That's otherwise right. I can say, well, you defamed me because you look at me in the wrong way. That's right. It can be <laughs> defined by. That's just a silly example, but Dirty like look. it can be yeah. defined by anything. Then so there has to be yeah. a standard by way you determine those things. Absolutely. So Nick, does yes. uh, do the proponents of social justice do they have limits on how far those positive rights go? You guys are just one step ahead of me. We're right. To, we're about to get right there. This is. This is this is really good because the the argument is going to be that there there is it's the the end of positive rights is absurdity because there is no the, the end of it is a ridiculous impossible uh, avenue I mean you're not and I'll I'll get to that right here because I'm gonna I'm gonna quote extensively now so please forgive me for reading but this is I think this just needs to be laid out the way that Beiser says it. Uh, uh, properly understood, rights are not guarantees that something will be provided for us but guarantees that what is ours will not be unjustly taken from us. That is, properly speaking, rights are not positive but negative. Why? First, because there's no objective, universal, unchanging standard by which to determine how much of any given benefit everyone has a right to. Since justice requires impartiality, proportionality, and the conformity to God's, to God's laws, rights must be the same and unchanging for everyone. If everyone has a right to food, how many calories per day? And of what com uh, composition? Meat, vegetables, grains, dairy products, fish? And quality does everyone have right to? Does a 30-pound three-year-old have the right to the same amount of calories as a 200-pound 30-year-old farm laborer? If everyone has a right to shelter, of what size and quality and what location must it be in? 
Uh, secondly, this reasoning points uh, toward another problem with positive rights. The assertion of positive rights necessarily entails the violation of negative rights. Well, the assertion of negative rights doesn't. If someone has a positive right to food, which he dealt with, but refuses to work for it, his right can be supplied by taking food from someone else who has worked for it. Furthermore, advocates of positive rights cannot justify either A, limiting the equalization of wealth to any geographic boundary, an example, a welfare system that would make the North American recipient very rich person indeed were he to live in Bangladesh, can hardly be justified, especially on the egalitarian grounds of the welfare rights philosophy. So there's, there's the thing, is if we're going to set a standard here, in all consistency, that should be worldwide then, which gets ridiculous because that's, there's going to be immediate problems with that. And when it comes to cal like food, how much, is, how, how much does everyone have, how many calories per day do we have a right to? And obviously that differs from what people need. And so it's, there is no set standard. It becomes ridiculous. It becomes absurd because you can't press it to, to its logical end without going crazy. I mean, the, the second, I, this basically sums it up as best as I can. Uh, Beiser says, the second big problem is limiting equalization merely to wealth, which is after all less important than such things as intellect or talent. Suppose there was a machine that could transfer IQ or beauty or talent from one person to another. Should we force those who have more of these attributes to share them via this machine? That would be real equality compared to the cry for transfers of money from rich to poor, which pale into in, in significance. And that's, that's the point. Like, the, every one of us, the whole, the whole idea that the positive right advocates are missing is the sovereignty of God and giving to each person according to what he pleases. Some people he gives certain talents and uh, uh, gifts to, and some he doesn't. The idea of positive rights is no, everyone has to have the same gifting, the same, the same things, the same abilities, the same talents. Otherwise, there's disparities, and there's injustice, and there's differences, and someone's going to have more than another person, and that can't be. Well, it's, 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 it's surely against the sovereignty of God and God's law when you start looking at the basis of what they're saying. If I have been given a gift to be extremely talented in physics and chemistry, and I am being able to rise in the ranks of chemical engineering, and I become wealthy because I can do that, and someone else has no mathematical or scientific skills at all, there's not injustice there. The fact is God has given one person skills in one area that he's using, hopefully for the glory of God, and another person he's given other things to, to be done in the way that God has given them to him. So, again, there's, there's never going to be a way to fully equalize everything on this earth when it comes to talent, beauty, IQ, wealth, privilege, or... Uh, uh, geographic boundaries. It says in Acts 17, he's, he's basically given uh, the boundaries to each uh, nation to where they should dwell, or, or people group to where they should dwell. And so it, it's a, just a high-handed rebellion against the sovereignty of God and God's law to think that everyone needs to have the same exact thing. Otherwise, there's injustice there. And again, by what Danny was saying, by what standard do we even apply justice in this, uh, or injustice in this this topic here. So uh, before I move on, does, does that make sense or did that kind of like go over people's heads a bit? Good? Oh boy, here we go. <laughs> yes, well, I mean, let me, let, uh, we're, oh, I want to phrase it in the right way. Now we're talking about you know, the world and everything else. How does this apply in the local church then? You know, why, why does this concept matter in the local church? And you know, this, this isn't just, just for Nick. This is that's where you're going next. I was going to go there next. Oh, yeah. <laughs> believe it or not. Okay. It's like well, you've read then. this book before or something. Did you guys talk to each other. <laughs> <laughs> My link. Yeah. You can't shut it off. It's a bit strange. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Well, I, I, what I'm about to talk about doesn't exhaust that at all. So that would, I mean, if anyone has its comments, please bring that up because this is some. Oh, please, yes. Um, since. The earliest foundations of the United States are in Christianity. Mm -hmm. Does is um, that part of the whole life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness? Abs does that fall into absolutely negative or positive? I, I just wonder how that. 
It, it, it does, yeah. So, the, so the idea of negative rights is you don't, the, the you know, the founding fathers, though some of them were deists, so they weren't truly Christian. They 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 drew a lot from the Christian principles, and so one of their, one of the the major works that the founding fathers drew from was Lax Rex, which is in Latin for "Law is King." It was written by a Presbyterian man named uh, Samuel Rutherford, and it basically said that our idea of justice and government and rights come from the Bible, not from human reason or autonomy. And so the idea then is that we have the right to not be as the people in England were oppressed by the state they, the, for religious liberty. It's, the, it's not that you have the right to do whatever you want. You have the right to not have the state impinge upon your right to come and worship. Uh, you have the right to pursue happiness and, and to have freedom, but, uh, but not do whatever you want. Does that make sense? It's, it's the idea of the state can't come in and tell you to do this, this, or that, or take these things from you. And so they drew extensively from a biblical worldview, and that's why we have what we have here in America. So this is very anti-American as well. Not only is it anti-Christian, it's anti-American. Uh, so, which is controversial to say, but I'll say it. So, and Lex Rex, you know, the, it, it's Latin for the law is king. Yeah, yeah. And the, the concept is is that every single person, even a king, is accountable to the, to the law, God, to the yeah. law of God. Yeah, that's right. So, because if you if you claim if because the old the old theory of divine right of kings yeah. is that God has given me the authority to rule. Well, but the, the flip side, if you claim to take authority from God, the flip side of that is that you are accountable to God. Mm -hmm. You can't claim the one without the other. So that's where, that was what Rutherford was getting at, is that the concept that everybody is accountable to the law of God. That's right. right. Yes. Yeah, and I think, uh, you know, what Denny was about was saying there, does that answer, answer your question? Perfect. Uh, was, you know, how do we operate in the church then? You know, what, what, is, what are we to do as a church? What are we called to do when we see injustices or things, true injustices in society? Uh, I'll, I'll get to that in just a sec. I just want to read one last little quote here. Uh, Progressive social justice violates negative rights and biblical criteria for justice in order to give positive rights as the government tries to mitigate such inequalities. And that's at the essence of the problem is the only way to try and get these positive rights and these injustices solved is you have to go to the government. The government has to somehow you know, equalize society, and that in itself, in the church, and to, to even think that way as a Christian is very dangerous to say, we're gonna start giving power and authority and, and, and uh, decisions to the government to equalize everything. We're gonna give it to a select group of men that probably aren't even Christian to try and apply non-biblical standards of justice in society and in the church. Well, it doesn't take much of, you know, studying or intellect to understand that's going to be a disaster, and that's not going to go well for Christians, or it's not going to go well for many people, as we've seen in the past, when you see Marxism driven to its logical end, that's, that's straight totalitarian communism that we saw in the Soviet Union and the Eastern European bloc countries, and we've seen in China, it's always an elitist totalitarian regime comes in, and what happens is what's the commune of people isn't everyone raised up on one high plane of existence, everyone's brought to a very low level, but we all have the same thing, it's just not much. And there is the government that then distributes everything and has control. It's not freedom. It's it's totalitarianism, uh, and it's a slippery slope to get there. And this these language, sorry, yep, go ahead, Dave. Yeah. I don't remember if Meisner touches this or not, but about the sufficiency of the local church. A little bit. Oh, okay. I, I was. Please, please say something. Yeah, I was. I was going to say is that, you know, one thing. Uh, and this is uh, from Kuy Kuyper, Abraham Kuyper, who lived. Hundred years ago, at least. The early twentieth century. Yeah, um, I was just remember the exact number, the exact dates. But one thing he talks about how there's um, the, the standard phrase he uses sphere sphere it's sovereignty. Like, In other oh, words, yeah. that each um, part of human society, including you know the church, has its own dom dominion. When we use that phrase, mm -hmm. its own influence of where it, that's right. And it has its boundaries. And so like this comes, you know, especially important when it comes to the question of um, the family, for example. Um, how much gov how much governmental control does the how much control and power does the government have over the family? Um, where is the, where is the balance of its powers? You know, right. if there is, if, if 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 indeed it does have you know authority over the family, all these things, uh, or like for example, or more specifically in the church context, mm -hmm. you know, we say mm -hmm. that we had to go to the government to help equalize everything, then we're denying that there that Christ has given sufficient authority to the local church. That's right. You know, which is one of the main th things that we talk about 
at this point now, many weeks ago, uh, with the 1689 study on chapter 26 early on, the fact that Christ is the Lord of the church, and that by being the Lord of the church, and by through the Spirit, um, leads the church. Yeah. And that if we're, if we're saying we have to go to the government, then we're saying that Christ's authority is not enough. We have to go to someone else mm -hmm. uh, to help lead the church properly, to help settle things and everything else. It's going to Caesar instead of to Christ to yeah. figure out our problems. Yeah, that's, that's absolutely right. Uh, does anyone else have anything before we move on? Well, it seems like if, if you're the Bible, he gives mm -hmm. some to be, if God gives some to be preacher, some to be teacher, that's some right. evangelist, and he has a sphere in there where yeah. everyone is, there's no equality in a sense. Right. <clears throat> equality of worth or, or of dignity, but not of, of position. That's right, yeah. Then, I guess we, and I guess even with, if everyone should be able to be a preacher, then why not women preachers? Right. Why even have, like some of the some of the denominations don't even have preachers, they just men stand up, right? Oh, so yeah. I wonder yeah. if they kind <laughs> of grab onto some of those those ideas also. Yeah. Yeah, and you, you're right. We, we are all equal in the eyes of God when it comes to salvation. Like, you know, we're not, we don't, none of us merit it. We're all completely condemned by the law. But then there are, there is an order God has in his world, in the family, in the church, and even in society. And that isn't unjust because he's ordered it that way. It's for our good. Uh, and so, yeah, that's, it's very true. And there are, yeah, there are some very, you know, extreme groups like, you know, the Quakers or Plymouth Brethren that go that direction where to even have a pastor is wrong. You know, you just gifted brethren. But even that is, you know, they're gifted. Right. So so there this even there it's like, yeah, it doesn't So do some of the do some of the proponents um, are they taking that and applying it to their church in that way as well? Well I think what's happening is that uh, it, it always it, it always comes down to money. It's not so much that they're, I, I think the idea, at least in some of the examples, is listen, there are some churches uh, that are mostly composed of white evangelicals that have a lot of money, and it's unjust that they have all of that, and s especially since in the past uh, there has been, you know, ra which we all agree there's been racism in this country, but the idea is because we are because they are white they somehow were connected to that atrocity in the past of slavery and the jim crow laws and so if there is a black church which is unfortunately we have to you know these monikers for like black church white church but if there's a mostly black or african-american church that's poor they don't have a lot of uh, uh, resources it is unjust that this white evangelical church has so much they need to be either very strongly encouraged to invest money into that church or if they won't coerced into doing so and that would be justice it normally comes down to money the sad part is like you know people talk about well, this this and that it kind of always comes down to the money aspect of you know who's got the money and who's you know who who needs it and it's unfortunately yeah it the last few years has seen a lot of uh, a lot of fights over this uh, we'll get into that in a sec when it comes to the social justice the Dow statement and some of the, uh, we talked about last week, the conferences that have come out, the MLK 50 conference in the spring of 2018, uh, Revoice, these different conferences in the evangelical quote unquote world. Uh, so it, it's, it's a growing country that's only getting worse, unfortunately. Uh, so it's, it's good that we're all learning this and we're trying to figure out, and we have to have a positive, which I'm about to get to, a positive response to people that are poor and people that are truly been, uh, you know, violated in the sense that they, there's been injustice done. We can't l forget these categories because it'll be easy for people using the same terms to, to beguile us into some form of socialistic, progressive social justice because they use emotion, right? Look at these people that are suffering. Don't you want to help? And here's a way to help them. So in saying that, yeah. So I just, I mean, this is, I guess, maybe this is more philosophical, but the, the idea that because I'm white, I'm somehow related to, uh, just as guilty as someone else, who is someone 100 years ago who right. was a slave owner, that's guilt by association, which mm -hmm. is a logical policy. Right. So basic, basic philosophy 101 tells you, or argumentation or anything 101 mm -hmm. tells you that's wrong because it's guilt by association. So... You know, from a biblical sense, or even from from a basic philosophical sense, it is utterly wrong in every conceivable level, <laughs> and not illogical. Yeah. Basically. 
Yeah. And so, uh, you know, for my so a quick personal thing is that you know we we none of this is to say don't help the poor or don't you know like none of this is to say don't go and be don't be outraged by violations of God's law or by people being unjustly treated. It's be wise and 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 know and have an intelligent understanding of how to help people and what is really a violation of of justice. You know, I was uh, I was in homeless youth ministry for four years, and so I I've, I've I have a heart for people. I, I see people's uh, suffering, and we wanted to help these people as a ministry of mercy, and we wanted to preach the gospel to them first and foremost. But we also wanted to help meet some of their physical needs and and the fact that they didn't have ho- houses or food and things of that nature. But the more I began to study this concept of social justice, I started to see the slippery slope you can get on uh, when you don't have good groundings where you can basically have the church turn into a social service center that just kind of meets community needs that has nothing to do with the gospel and it's completely dictated by a government ide- ideology of, well, here's what this community needs and we're gonna, well, the, the church, what you need to do is just be a soup kitchen that, full of nice people. Well, no, 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 that's, that's, that's not what the church's main purpose is for, but we should still help poor people. So how do we walk that balance? How does that poised, balanced position work itself out? Well, this don't, won't exhaust it, but I think it starts to, to give some good ideas here. So, so what do we do about those who are being treated unjustly, and what do we do about the poor? Because the poor are particularly vulnerable to injustices in ways others aren't, the poor therefore are more frequently victims of injustice than, other, than others are. Furthermore, many Hebrew words translated poor in the context often emphasize not material destitution, but vulnerability to oppression. So it's not always monetary. Uh, someone who might be disabled or someone that might just be uh, or elderly, you know, or, or just uh, uh, sickly, that it doesn't technically need to make them, you know, financially poor. It's just those who are uh, more open to being oppressed by people. Uh, is, is more of a biblical understanding. So, however, we focus on justice for the poor because they are so often victims of injustice. In contrast, because we exercise charity or grace towards them simply because we are poor, they are poor. So here's the concept of, as a church, we are to offer and we are to exercise grace, love, and charity to them. The church is to extend itself and to, and to help those in society, not out of coercion because we're told to, and not because... Uh, they, you know, they have their, they have less money, and therefore, because they have less money, we have to do something. It's no, because they are being potentially uh, uh, used by those in society. Potentially, they have been assaulted or stolen from, and we want to be salt and light to these people, and we want to present the gospel to them and help them, as Jesus said, to help them. But it's not out of a sense of coercion or because the government is telling us to do so, or because we have so much, therefore. If we see someone with a uh, disparity or someone with less, we have to equal that out immediately. Otherwise, that's biblically unjust, which is not the case. Uh, While justice, then, is never partial to the poor, it recognizes that the poor are often vulnerable to injustice. Justice is therefore particularly apt to come to their aid in vindication, uh, justification, or salvation. So preaching the poor, or preaching the gospel to them as... uh, Brother uh, uh, Daryl Harrison, in his talk two weeks ago at the social justice uh, uh, lecture he gave, is in Mark, I think it was Mark or Luke 7, where it talks about Jesus uh, being approached by John's disciples after he had gone, been put into prison. And they ask me, you know, are you the Messiah or do we have to wait for someone else? And Jesus lists off all of the things that he has done to say, listen, what do you think? The, the, the blind see, the dead are raised to life, and the lame can walk. And the poor have the gospel preached unto them. Not the poor have houses. Not the poor have been given everything that they physically need. Not that they have jobs and they have, you know, savings and they're financially wealthy now. The poor have the gospel preached unto them. And and Jesus' emphasis there is that what they needed most is not money, was the gospel just like everyone else. And so we we need to keep that in mind there of our, our goal and the principles that we want to imply are the advancement of God's kingdom, that they are sinners in the sight of God, they need the gospel just like anyone else, and that we are not to be impartial towards them, to raise them up to a place where we are showing them favoritism over other people. It needs to be just. 
impartial, proportionate, and according to God's law. Yes, Denny. You know, and one thing that you know Harrison kind of pointed it out is yep. that where was John the Baptist in that context? In prison. In prison. Yeah. You know, like you know, Jesus being the God Man in one sense had the, all the authority and power, being the you know being divine, to storm and send angels, storm the place, and free John from injustice because I mean John was unjustly placed place in prison. All he did was speak against Herod for uh, being in a wrong, 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 sinful relationship uh, with his brother's wife. That's the situation, right? Yeah. No. Okay, let's make sure it's brother's wife. Um, yet, Jesus doesn't do that. And what ends up happening to John the Baptist? Beheaded. Gets beheaded. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I mean, it's just an interesting reality, even right there, that... Right. Uh, to think about. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm just going to read one more quote from Beiser and then we'll move on to the Dallas statement. So, one last thing I think is helpful here. He says, does this make it wrong to try to mitigate inequalities in society? No. It only makes it wrong to try to do so through force of government. Voluntary efforts are good and, uh, excuse me, voluntary efforts are good and do no injustice. And the reason for this distinction is that it is done voluntarily as an act of charity or grace. And that's what we're called to do as the church. It's a voluntary act of showing love toward our neighbor. Not because we are forced into it or people are guilting us into it or because the government tells us to do so. It's something that should be flowing. God loves a cheerful giver. It should be flowing out of our hearts to do good to those around us. If we see the poor without clothing or shelter or food, we should want to, out of charity and love for them, help them, not because there's a government mandate forcing us to or because we're being uh, basically bullied or guilted into doing it. So the church's job in this sphere is to be charitable and gracious and loving. And the government is supposed to uphold justice in society. Biblical justice, as Romans 13 lays out, that they bear not the sword in vain. They're supposed to punish evildoers. That's basically the role of government. If you look at Paul's view of it, Romans 13 is basically saying the government is ordained by God to punish evildoers so that there's not rampant chaos in society. They're not really supposed to be a force for social reform. That might be really radical to hear in our day and age, but biblically, the government is simply negative. It just is supposed to enforce law so that there's no chaos. I mean, that's basically the government in the view of the government that Paul has. So we've gone so far from that, we have, a, we have so much the government does now for us that we just assume that the government's role is to do this, 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 when it's really just supposed to be to enforce law and order. And that's, it, what, it, that's what it was. So Paul was saying in Romans 13, uh, so we have a long ways to go as a society and even as a church to really get back to the understanding of church, state relations, spheres of influence, biblical justice, uh, and when it comes to what our roles are. Um, so I will uh, leave it at that for this section here. Does anyone have any questions, concerns? No, I'm moving to the Dallas statement. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh yeah. I'm I'm the I would say that I think too, you look at what has welfare done for the individual person, the right. dignity. Yeah. What has government aid done for the person's dignity? What about when you have, when people who are believers and they're trying to be faithful and they reach out and, and have relationships with people right. and then they increase their dignity and they have this sense of belonging right. and it takes away that fundamental isolation or, or loneliness in a person. That's a much better, I mean, obviously people can't eat to die. Right, right. But if to to the effect that with all the welfare and all the giving and all the programs, you still have people who are fundamentally broken. Yep. And absolutely. Christ is in the is in not the business, but He is the one who gives new life. That's right. And if we're to be faithful mm -hmm. as gospel yes. um, laborers in a sense, yes. lay laborers, then that should really be our focus, right? We want to meet yeah. people's needs, but we want to have that relationship and actually connect and provide hope. Absolutely. That's right. Yeah, I mean, there's a whole, there's, I mean, time forbids us to go there, but there's a whole other, you know, large section of going into the idea of the welfare state and how it's caused more damage than good. And it's just, God, it's, it, we don't have the time to go there, but yeah, that, that also would be, for individual study to look into that, uh, one book I would recommend is Social Justice in the, is it just called, in the Evangelical Church or just? 
in the Christian Church by uh, Ronald Nash. Very good. It's very, very good. Uh, so anyways, uh, I'm going to finish up here uh, in the next 10 minutes just uh, going over some highlights from the Dallas Statement on Social Justice. And so if you guys don't know what that was, back in the fall of 2018, a year ago, uh, there was a meeting of brethren in Dallas, Reformed Brethren in Dallas, that basically got together to produce a uh, succinct statement to give a positive view uh, of the, the Bible's uh, teaching on justice and then to refute the movement within evangelicalism with the social justice movement. And so it falls on the, tra uh, the heels of other statements in the past, like the Nashville Statement on sexuality, the Chicago Statement on inerrancy of scripture. So I wanted to really point this out here. We're, we're really in a historic time right now because when you look all the way back to the early church, the church has always had this, uh, this, uh, this within themselves of gathering together in the face of controversy, whether it be counselor or not, we call it the statements now, but it's basically... You look at the Council of Nicaea, that was to respond against Arianism. You look at the, uh, the Council of Chalcedon, that was to respond against the, the heresies involving uh, the humanity and deity of Christ. And all the way down the line, you see every time there's a major uh, front to the church, godly men gather together and they produce a succinct statement. So this is a very historic thing that happened last fall. It falls in the line of our historic uh, Orthodox understanding of uh, giving clear, delineated responses to controversies that have come against the church. If you haven't read it, I would highly recommend it. It's online. It's at the statement on the so. I'm probably the, the website is the so, the statement on social Is it in the book there? It is. I just have excerpts on my phone here, but uh, just the website. The website. Yeah. Let me look really quick. Uh, if you guys haven't read it. I would highly recommend you do. It's not in here. It's shorter than the 1689, so don't worry. It is shorter than the, yeah. It, it, is, it is. It's like it's like five pages, so it's it doesn't take that long to read. Uh, really, yep. It's not in here. So, uh, anyways, uh, some men, some of the main signers and the uh, producers of the document were uh, men such as Dr. James White, Dr. Vody Bochum, Dr. Josh Bice, Dr. John MacArthur. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Tom Askell, so some some very solid. Sam Waldron. Sam Waldron, yeah. No, well, he well he didn't he wasn't a he signed it, but he didn't. Yeah. yeah. But anyways, thousands of people have signed it since then. I've signed it. I would encourage all of you if you feel convicted that these truths I'm just going to read a few of them are are right and biblical that you should sign it because they've been asking Christians to go on and sign it and show support for it. Uh, so anyways. So I'm going to pull some little quotes here from the Dallas Statement just so you can hear what they're talking about here. So, Just what I found it. It's, it's a statement on socialjustice.com. Perfect. The statement on socialjustice.com. No, the, just statement. Statement on socialjustice.com. Thank you. Uh, so Article 6, the Gospel. We deny that anything else, whether works to be performed or opinions to be held, can be added to the gospel without perverting it into another gospel. This also means that implications and applications of the gospel, such as the obligation to live justly in the world, though legitimate and important in their own right, are not definitional components of the gospel. So the gospel is salvation through Jesus Christ alone, through repentance towards God and faith in Him. It's not anything else. You can't add in and living righteously. You can't add in and helping the poor. And all these, that's what they're trying to get at here. It's the, the, the purity of the gospel. Not letting other things that are good and right once you have become saved to do. Justification by faith alone, Christ alone, by His grace alone, to the glory of God alone is basically what they're getting at there. And so they've worded that very carefully. And I think if you read that over, you'll see, again, the, the reason why they use certain words. So another section, uh, section eight, the church. We deny that political or social activism should be viewed as integral uh, part of the gospel or primary to the mission of the church. Though believers can and should utilize all lawful means that God has providentially established to have some effect on the laws of society, we deny that these activities are either evidence of saving faith or constitute a central part of the church's mission given to her by Jesus Christ, her head. We deny that laws or regulations possess, uh, possess any inherent power to change sinful hearts. I thought that was very well put. You know, it's, it's good and right for us to try and influence our society being salt and light, but it's foolish to think that laws and the government are going to change fallen humanity uh, to do things that they don't want to do. 
uh, it's not a part of the gospel. It's something we should do, but it's not a definitional cardinal gospel issues. That they're going to keep hammering at that because you hear that if you've done any research into this, the social justice advocates in the church are saying, this is a gospel issue. This is a gospel issue. This is a gospel issue. And they're strongly refuting that in this statement saying it's not a gospel issue because what are you really saying when you say it's a gospel issue? Uh, section 10, sexuality and marriage. We affirm that God created mankind male and female and that this is divinely determined distinction is good, proper, and to be celebrated. Maleness and femaleness are biologically determined at conception and are not subject to change. The curse of sin results in sinful, disordered affections that manifest in some people as same-sex attraction. Salvation grants sanctifying power to renounce such dishonorable affections as sinful and mortify them by the Spirit. Those who lack the desire or opportunity for marriage are called to serve God in singleness and chastity. We deny that human sexuality is a socially constructed concept. We also deny that one sex can be fluid. We reject gay Christianity as a legitimate biblical category. We further deny that any kind of partnership or union can properly be called marriage other than the one man and one woman in lifelong covenant together. We further deny that people should be identified as sexual minorities, which serves as a cultural classification rather than the one that honors the image-bearing character of human sexuality as created by God. It's a very strong statement. And I think it you know, stands against what we were talking about, this whole idea of gay Christian uh, people taking onto themselves that, I, uh, that label and that group that they're identifying with. And it obviously stands against transgenderism, saying that sex or gender is fluid. Uh, so it's a very good and strong statement in that aspect. And finally, one last thing here. Uh, racism. I think this is uh, Article 14. We affirm that racism is, sin, is a sin rooted in pride and malice, which must be condemned and renounced by all who would honor the image of God in all people. But the denial clarifies this. We deny that only those in positions of power are capable of racism or that individuals of any particular ethnic group are incapable of racism. And the reason they say that is there are many people teaching that you can only be racist if you are the dominant ethnic group in a society. So minorities can't be racist because they're the oppressed class in society and therefore what they're saying isn't, if they say anything against your ethnic group, it's not racism, they're just speaking from their oppressed position. And they also say that anyone in a position of power uh, is racist, anyone that doesn't have any power can't be racist. Well that denies total depravity, it denies the fact that people can be sinful whether they're poor or rich or weak or powerful. People are sinful and so those are just a few excerpts. It's a very good statement. Some people think it, do, think it doesn't go far enough. I think it is just sufficient uh, for what we need. So that was the Dow Statement of Social Justice. Again, I encourage you guys to look at that yourself. Uh, and that is uh, basically what I had for today. So is there any final thoughts or questions? or? I just have a question. Yeah. <coughs> this isn't what it was originally hammered out. There were other aspects. You said it was strict. It was streamlined, the Dow statement. Uh, if, I, and if so, what were what was taken out? I'm not I'm not totally aware of that. I know that there were uh, I've heard discussions online where there were some people that wanted it to be more in in its affirmations of the effect of the gospel. Some people thought it was a little weak, uh, and some people. So basically, the idea is that in their denials, everyone was agreeing they did a really good job in what they're denying. But some of the affirmations of the gospel and the effect on society and the gospel and its effect through history wasn't as clear or like wasn't as robust as they would like it. But again, I listen to those. I go, okay, that in in a in a situation that we're in right now, we, okay, it's not a perfect statement, but I think. On, on the whole, it's a very well-written statement, and I don't think it was intended to be this robust, systematic theology of the effect of the gospel on society. But from what, I, from what I've read and what other people have read, I think it's a totally fine statement, and um, it does a good job in what it needed to do. And so, yeah, I guess that's, that's well, the extent of the controversy around it. I know that when it comes to people agreeing with it, many people don't like it because they hate the denials. Uh, meaning they're part of the social justice mm -hmm. ideological movement and they find the denials stinging. So, um, yes, Denny. 
I think this was mentioned last time. I just, just for for <laughs> the sake of a reminder, yep. that uh, we have to remember that uh, that uh, this it's a gradient mm. uh, when it comes to the social justice. Cause you have the extreme liberals like James right. Cone, who was, you know, if you want an example of a um, you know of a black man who's completely racist, hates white people, read his stuff. Yeah. He he like when you read his stuff, you. He says some really nasty stuff against um, anyone who anyone who's not black. Let's put it that way. Yep. Um, and apparently, to tell us anyone, shut your mouth. You can't say anything. Yep. You don't know what you're talking. about. I got a question about that. Yes. Would he say that he's incapable of racism because yes. he's black? Yes. He can make those statements. Yep. But if a white person was to make those statements, right. he'd be a racist. Yeah. Right. Really? I mean, we read his yep. stuff. It's. I mean, I'm not exaggerating. Like. It's, it's, he's, yeah, it's, it's heinous. Like yeah. if a white man said that against a color person, or whatever else, like everyone would jump on that person. Mm. But because he's a well-known, famous, well, now dead, liberal professor and all these things, um, it's all okay. He gets a pass. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, and when you, I, I brought it up before in the past, but uh, in some conversations, but there was a <coughs> conference type of thing two years ago, I think, in now? I can't remember. But in celebration of James Cone, because he's already dead, um, at Fuller Seminary, at least I think it was in light of and for him, um, and one of, the, one of the discussion panels that I listened to was called titled "Can White People Be Safe?" <laughs> now, what he means by that, he doesn't just mean white skin color, but um, anyone who yeah, holds right. to Whiteness. white mentality, yep. um, the ideology of that's white. And so, long story short, he pretty much says at the end, when, and to answer the question, he's um, of can white people be safe? He says, no. Um, so pretty much anyone who's holds to a white mentality can't be safe. You have to get out of that and go to what he calls black blackness. mentality. Yeah. Blackness. Salvation is blackness. Exactly. Yeah. And he pretty much says that Christianity mm -hmm. has been twisted by whiteness and all these things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So like, no, this is the extreme liberal side. Yeah. Then you have some folks who are more on the conservative side, but because they see what we can call genuine concerns of yeah. racism that Nick brought up. Right. But because there are, you know, um, you know, you know it's not really a question that, you know, at the times church in the past, certain churches, I'll clarify this, certain churches in the past have failed to, you know, live up the gospel. Oh, uh, absolutely. Show gospel yeah. love in the right way. Oh, yeah. Uh, and, and because of that, they have the question, okay, well, how should we do this? And they hear the social justice stuff and they say, well, this is possibly a solution. So they're not, you know, the liberal, like the extreme liberal side. Right. But they are, you know, it doesn't mean they doesn't give them a total pass no. necessarily, but they're not... How you say necessarily enemies of the faith. That's right. Those more conservative brothers. Thank you They're for, just yeah, yeah. brothers who are yeah. have genuine concerns but are going towards solutions or methods that are maybe right. not the best. Let's put that, that yeah, Thank you for clarifying like. that. Yeah, there there are gradients. It's not like everyone I'm, everyone in the social justice movement is a flaming liberal. I'm not saying that. But like yeah, the, I'm just trying to give you the the ideology that's really at the bottom of oh, all yeah. of it. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, but the, but yeah, the gradients are there are many conservative reform brethren. That's why I'm bringing this up. There are many conservative reform brethren that are taking some of these views, not wholesale, but little bits and pieces, because they see, you know, the the kind of groundswell in this culture of moving towards that, and they they don't want to be uh, left behind, as it were, or they want to be able to. They they want to be uh, they want to speak to it in a very contemporary way, and so they're borrowing. I think, and in, in, in good intentions, borrowing some of the terminology and some of the methodologies, but the whole point is, as soon as you do that, it's a, the whole slippery slope thing. It just, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So one of the other things too is that um, this is, I mean, so one of the things that Dr. White says a lot, but is that um, is that the whole concept of whiteness and blackness really doesn't make any sense because. Because as a as a well for many reasons, but as a worldview, it it only makes a shred of sense in the American context. Right. But if you take it anywhere else to South Africa or any other place, it, it makes no sense. You know that could be it, it, and that's I mean that's one way you can tell something is is a solid worldview or not is like does it make sense regardless of context? Mm -hmm. And this one completely doesn't. Like if you were if you were to talk to other places where you know, where maybe black people are oppressing white people or black people are oppressing other black people. Right. It's, it's, it, 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 they, they would say, what are you talking about? I need to d divest my whiteness. You know, like that makes no sense. Um, so, yeah. So that's yeah, one of the other things. It's, it, and it's a little bit ironic also in that sense because that also demonstrates how 
sh- short-sighted and culturally unaware it actually is. <laughs> the, the how much how much uh, American centric you could say mm. and completely mm. oblivious to any other cultural context right. Right. and considering that it's being that in an attempt to be equal and culturally sensitive is very ironic yeah. Um. Yeah. so people had a biblical worldview mm-hmm. this would almost be irrelevant yeah sure. yep yeah, it wouldn't even be on the radar really no no. So it all comes down to it. All comes back to the Bible and having a oh. proper worldview yep. and understanding what the gospel is. Are they and good? practicing it as well? Yeah. Well, yes. Or the yes. Praxis, right? practicing comes after understanding. Well, I don't say that. <laughs> yeah. But I think that's why it's it's penetrating into evangelicalism because there's so much biblical illiteracy right. Right. that mm-hmm. it, since people aren't able to line things up with mm-hmm. Scripture as the contrast. They're susceptible to deception. Oh, yeah. So I think that's what's going on. See, oh, there's yeah. just a lack of <coughs> biblical discernment. I think, I think that's, that's a, at the bottom of it. I think yeah. that's right. What's that? This laziness on the part of Christians. Mm. Yes. Mm. To know what the Bible <coughs> teaches. So they can see these things in, in clarity and make distinctions right. yeah. that aren't being made and things are being blurred. Yeah. Hosea said, My people are destroyed for a lack yeah. of knowledge. Yeah. 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 That's right. Well, does anyone have any last parting words? I appreciate this study very much. Yeah, exactly. yeah. Did, did you say that there's another one, or is it just the second of the two? <coughs> no, the, we're gonna we're gonna pick back up at sixteen eighty nine next week. Okay, Lord willing. So, I think Joe's got the next one. Yeah, I'm up. <laughs> Here we go. In a while. Yeah. Well, in that, Joe, would you like to close this, please? Yeah. Thank you. Lord God. Uh, we see so much going on in the church today, Lord, and we want to honor you in all things. So we ask that you would uh, that you would give every one of us in this room wisdom about these things, Lord, that you would give us discernment and knowledge, that you would help us to, to study these things to the extent that we should, that we can have a working understanding. Mm-hmm. Help us to be gracious and loving to individuals, but help us to not fear man and stand up for the truth. Lord, we, 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 uh, we want to be charitable, we want to be kind, we want to be patient to those, but we, uh, we do not want to spread lies and deception. So give us wisdom, give us discernment, help us to respond to these things as we should as Christians. And we also ask that you bless the rest of our Lord's mm-hmm. Day today. We ask that you bless the fellowship, um, grow uh, the love amongst us here in this room. <laughs> Lord, we ask that um, our hearts would be warmed and our souls would be refreshed as we mm. go into a new week. Mm. So Lord, we thank you for the blessings that you pour down upon us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.